Hey witches, Tiffany here, two and a half weeks postpartum <laughs> on Bewitching Bemused. Uh, before we even start this video, here are several disclaimers. One, it's very hot. I have multiple fans running right now, so I apologize if there's any audio feedback. Sorry about that. I also currently have a baby in my lap. As you can see, I'm sitting here in bed, chilling in jammies. <laughs> <laughs> and a nursing bra um and we're just hanging out she's she is awake right now but oh she just she of course as soon as i start filming she's getting a little fussy but that's okay that's okay Aww. Aww. next i will have to pause at some point in this video i'm sure to breastfeed so <laughs> at a certain point there's probably going to be like a major lighting change i might look a little more tired and Anyway, uh, so just that's why I'm doing what I can right now. I also don't actually know when this video is coming out. Like it might be this Sunday or it might be next Sunday or the next Sunday. I mean, we're in that postpartum period where you just never know when anything's going to get done and that's okay. As long as the baby's taken care of everything else, I'm just trying to embrace the chaos. Uh, final disclaimer, I don't actually know if I'm going to be showing the baby in this video, hence why she's below the camera. <laughs> the reason for this is because my husband is at work and I did not actually ask him if he was comfortable with me showing pictures of the baby in the, in the video. So I figure, okay, worst case scenario, when I edit later, I'll toss in some pictures like this one and this one. She's so cute. But anyway, this is my third trimester vlog, and I think I'm also going to include a bit about the delivery. I was going to do separate videos, and I honestly, I'm just falling so far behind on making videos. Not that I think anybody minds or expects me to just like keep up on the schedule, but I'm falling so far behind that I think I just kind of want to put these vlogs behind me um, and make this the last one. So I'll talk a bit about both and then, you know, yeah, call it a day. And as usual, these vlogs are more focused on the pagan and witchcraft aspects of my pregnancy and the labor and delivery um, than it is like a mommy vlog. So yeah. So if you're just tuning in and this is the first one that you've watched, that's basically what you can kind of expect. That and a lot of really lazy rambling because I am so tired, you guys. Okay, um, I'm gonna be honest, I don't quite remember where I left off. I mean, I left off at the end of the second trimester, but I don't remember, gosh, right even right now, everything's such a blur, I don't even remember when that was. Was that June? Beginning of June was the beginning of the third trimester? So I was doing physically really well for, for quite a while. Not that I was ever doing really bad, but I did hit a, hit a brick wall at a certain point and needed to just stop everything. <laughs> but at the beginning of the third trimester, I was doing pretty well. If you watched my spring vlog, you saw that I was pretty active. I did a little, little bit of light traveling, not very far. And I was still going out and doing things. Uh, we had two baby showers, which was awesome. One for family that was far away. Oh, sleepy. Okay. You know what? I was going to pause when the baby needed to nurse, but honestly, I don't know if I'm going to get a chance to finish filming this video if I do that. So we're nursing. We're just gonna keep it cropped. You can see her little hand. Okay, so in regards to like normal pregnancy stuff, we had two baby showers. One was for family and friends who were local in the area, and the other one was for over Zoom for long distance people, because it was sort of like, we just had a bunch of people come to our area for our wedding less, less than a year ago, and then and now we're gonna ask a bunch of people to travel all the way back and like the baby's not even here yet so we didn't want to like inconvenience people but we still wanted to kind of have a fun opportunity to you know just socialize a little bit before uh before the baby arrived and our lives got totally changed <laughs> and it was after that point which was late june that my energy levels really started to drop um we did have a couple of small health scares. The baby ended up being totally fine. I ended up being totally fine, but it was enough that my doctors were like, you need to, to kind of chill out a little. I wasn't put on full bed rest or anything, but pretty, I don't want to say close to it. That seems dramatic. 
But yes, I was forced to kind of pump the brakes on my activity level. I did still manage to make it to the county fair. I was in a wheelchair and my sister pushed me around, which was very luxurious. But it was very, very important to me to make it to the fair because the fair to me really marks summer. It is a sort of early celebration of Lunasa because of the historical correlation of the two events, basically. Lunasa is not a huge Sabbath for me, but that is one thing that I do tend to do, even if it's like a month early, because nowadays, you know, especially in, a, in America, well, of course, in America, uh, most fairs, state or county, etc., cetera, uh, overlap with the 4th of July versus happening in late July, early August. And I'm sure that's like a capitalism thing, but, um, but I still make sure to go and I view that as part of my observation of what Lunasa stands for um, in regards to life and activities, harvesting, um, gratitude, pride, etc. Um, not so much the, the seasonal aspects. I mean, all the, I mean, that's there too, of course, but, but you have farmers and you have craftspeople that are there showing off their, their livestock, showing off their crops, showing off their craft and their skills, sometimes competing and often selling everything that they've been working so hard on in the past year. And of course there's rides and there's cotton candy and beer and a lot of the stuff that I could not partake in because I was pregnant. Um, <laughs> not going on any kind of roller coasters this year, of course, which is unfortunate because I love roller coasters. But, um, you know, we spent a lot of time just inside looking at like the artwork exhibitions that they had, the garden exhibits, the animals, the especially the rabbits, the bunny rabbits. Um, in addition to that, in regards to summertime activities. Um, I was hoping to actually make it out to a natural body of water, uh, probably not the ocean. Although, I mean, maybe to like put my feet in, but, um, there were some lakes I was hoping to go to and spend some time just, you know, floating in, but it just didn't happen. I just didn't, honestly, I didn't like, I kept waiting to see if I had a day, a Saturday or Sunday where I woke up and went, yeah, today's the day. Let's go do that. And that just never happened, which that's fine. I kind of anticipated that that might be the case. I did enjoy some pool time though, which was really amazing to be in almost zero gravity for a bit with all of the aches and pains. Um, by the way, my baby was born eight pounds, 14 ounces. So... <laughs> So yes, I had the normal amount of third trimester aches and pains, but then it was also compounded by the fact that I had a big ass baby. I had to stop hiking. I think I actually mentioned this in the last one or perhaps in my, my spring vlog. I did have to stop hiking at a certain point. Um, it was just like becoming too, too intense for my body. Nature walks and hiking are usually some of my main ways of connecting to nature in the summer. Um, more spring, but summer as well. Um, as well as visiting the ocean. And so like none of that happened, but a lot of my time spent connecting to nature was me laying in a hammock in the backyard. I would just spend some time in the shade, just looking up at the sun being filtered through the leaves above me, just looking at the trees above me, listening to the wind, breathing in fresh air, and just, just enjoying that. Um, I also spent a lot of, a uh, lot of time in a meditative state. <laughs> in the third trimester because I just, okay, first of all, I was working on my, my, um, hypnobirthing prep, but I was also trying to keep my stress levels down, my anxiety down. And again, like I said, I was just physically very, very uncomfortable by that point. And so meditating was a really good way to kind of not relieve it. It doesn't get rid of it, but take myself away from it. Um, finding myself centered in my body in a way that is not uncomfortable or it sort of distracts from the discomfort because yes, because I wanted to basically enjoy the aches and pain relief with, while also staying grounded and present in my body and in the moment and with the baby too, of course, as for doing spells and rituals, I did, no, I did one. I was going to say I did zero because I didn't have the energy, but I did do one um, for a personal thing. So I'm not going to talk about it, but, um, I did do an ammonia jar, which was very, 
I mean, it was very low effort, I'm not gonna lie. Like I said, I just spent a lot of this time in my kind of spiritual aspect versus my magic witchcraft aspect, just connecting and communing with nature, um, with myself, with, and then with ancestors and Hecate as well. We're also, um, big components of that third trimester was just connecting and just sending out my prayers, I guess I want to say. Um, you know, Hecate is a protector of, of the vulnerable. So pregnant women, women in childbirth, and then of course, babies, newborn babies, unborn babies, children. Uh, so Hecate was definitely like a big aspect of like who I was reaching out to for assistance. Um, during the third trimester as well as during labor and delivery. And then of course ancestors because I'm adding somebody new to the family line and so it's just like, hey everybody heads up, we got a new one to look out for who's going to need guidance, who's going to need protection. Um, I'm going to need guidance and protection in the delivery of her and in the raising of her. And so um, that was a big part. Um, Hecate and ancestors were a big part of my third trimester. Um, I didn't do anything. I know people are going to ask about this. I didn't really do anything fancy to commune. I just spent time in meditative state. I spent time asking questions and just sending out um, my hopes and my desires and my, my worries, my fears, um, what I would like from them, um, also placing out offerings. Um, that was it. There was no elaborate rituals. There was nothing crazy. A lot of the time it was just me sitting quiet, tranced, sort of tranced out, um, and just projecting. Sometimes it wasn't even words. It was just feelings, like a feeling of protectiveness, um, to, to communicate. This is what I want for this child. I want her to be protected. And I would like your assistance with that sort of thing. As for the delivery, like I, like I said, I was going to save this for another video, but let me just tell you all now. Um, so um, if you watched my video, um, of like what I packed in my hospital bag and I, cause I don't remember if I touched on this in my last, in my last trimester video, the second trimester, I'm not sure if I actually talked about what my birth plan was. Um, but let's talk about what it was versus what actually happened, right? If you have absolutely no interest in listening to this part, because it has nothing to do with witchcraft, I just wanted to talk about the actual story and I thought some people might find it interesting. Don't worry. It's not very like gory or gross in my opinion anyway, but skip ahead to the timestamp on this screen. Um, if you have no interest in the whole labor and delivery aspect, hoped to go into labor after a long restful nights of sleep, which I hadn't had a restful night of sleep in like six months. So I don't know where I was getting that idea from. And then I hoped that I would be able to spend several hours at home, um, doing my hypnobirthing, through the early labor, walking around, uh, getting some movement in, and then eventually going, okay, we're at that point, either water's broken or contractions are this many minutes apart. Let's go to the hospital. And then there I would proceed to have a beautiful, um, unmedicated birth because I really didn't want to, and I'll come back to this. I really didn't want to have an epidural, um, primarily because I'm better with pain tolerance than I am with anxiety. And I know that my losing feeling and, and feeling trapped in that bed. Cause at that point you, you, you people can help you move, but you can't actually like get up and walk around when you have the epidural, of course. Um, I knew that that was going to cause me a lot of anxiety. And I'll get back to that in a minute. So that was the dream was no epidural. Uh, it would just be like hip, like hypnobirthing, meditation, um, massage, counter pressure, things like that. My husband took classes with me. We had it all planned out, ready to go. So the reality was my due date came, my due date went and she hadn't even dropped yet. So I was given the option to induce um, at that point, And I said, no, let's hold off another week. I was still hoping that labor would start naturally. So I spent the next week following all of the old wives tales, <laughs> trying to get that labor induced. It really just was not happening. She did drop a little bit, a little bit. She never fully dropped. Uh, I mean, until the time came, but, um, 
yeah, that point <laughs> at 40 weeks and six days, I went into my obstetrician and he goes, yeah, I think it's time to induce. The morning of my induction, I was scheduled to go in at 8 a.m. I woke up at 1 a.m. after three hours of sleep and was very, very uncomfortable. I did not understand that I was having contractions <laughs> because the timing was so irregular and it was mostly in my lower back and it just didn't feel anything like it was described to me. It just felt like all of the aches and pains I'd been having. And it didn't even feel like, cause I had been having Braxton Hicks contractions and it didn't even feel like those. So I did not realize I was in labor until I got to the hospital for my 8am appointment to be induced. And they hooked me up to the monitor and said, Oh, you're having contractions. And I went, Oh, that's what that is. Um, at that point I was only one centimeter though. So they did still give me the medication. They gave me a pill. I totally forget what it's called. Um, they gave me a pill to start off with. And basically it was like, give me a pill, wait four hours, do a cervical check. They did this three times. Nothing was happening. I did start having more intense contractions and what actually felt like what I expected contractions to feel like. Um, then that evening they started the Pitocin and I was pretty much up all night. I think I got about 15 minutes of a nap in, um, between the time they started the Pitocin and the time it like really ramped things up. So the, the issue, the biggest issue that I faced here was the damn monitors. You have the monitor for the contractions. You have the monitors for the baby's heartbeat, which is very sensitive. Then I had the one on my finger for my oxygen levels and uh, my blood oxygen levels and for my heart rate. And then I had the cuff on my upper arm that was going off. I think every 30 minutes they had it taking my blood pressure and it was really tight, really, really tight. Honestly, for a lot of it, that was more painful than the contractions. None of these were wireless. And the biggest issue I was facing was that I couldn't just get up and move around, which was odd to me. Call me naive. That is totally fine. Um, but when I took a tour of the hospital and when I took classes through the hospital, everyone kept talking about if you're doing unmedicated, one of the best things that you can do, not only for the pain, but also to speed up labor is use gravity, get up and move around, get up and stand and kind of sway in place. And I did do that as much as possible. And that I loved that felt amazing. Um, it felt like exactly what I needed to be doing both physically and mentally. And for the baby, it felt right, but I could only do it so much. I was only allowed to do it so much before nurses would come in and be like, yeah, we really need to get those monitors hooked back up. Cause you've been off of them for 30 minutes. And I do understand why it's, it's important for, it was important for my health and monitoring the baby's health to make sure everything was progressing safely, which it was, but we needed to continually mon monitor that. And I, and I get that, but it drove me nuts. And then you have the issue of having to pee, having to pee. If I wanted to pee, I again had to call a nurse and say, Hey, I'm going off the monitors. I have to pee, which was always a great big hassle. And also being up and moving about is one thing being in the bed and then getting out of the bed is very uncomfortable. When I was already up and moving about, I felt pretty good. But when I had to get my ass out of that bed, that was so hard to do. Then it also gave me, and I know it was, it's the nurse's jobs to help me with all of that, right? If, even if I have to pee every 10 minutes, that's their job. And to be fair, none of them acted like it was an inconvenience or anything. They were all absolutely amazing. Every single person that I worked with and I encountered at the hospital was amazing. I do want to say that much, but I started to feel like an inconvenience and I started to get annoyed myself because like I said, just getting out of that bed was a damn hassle. Yet when I had a full bladder, my contractions were so much more painful, so much more painful by 5 AM the following morning. So I, at that point had been in labor for about 28 hours. I was in a lot of pain. <laughs> Those contractions were coming very close together, very intensely. Thanks to the Pitocin, they were already less than a minute apart and a minute long at least. 
and yeah, it was, it was, it was a lot, but I was actually doing okay except that I was very tired. And up until that point, I had been using my hypnobirthing techniques. Those were working really well. My husband was a big help, except for the times that I told him like, you need to go sleep because one of us needs to not be sleep deprived. <laughs> so, but he had been present and so, so helpful the entire time. And the nurses came in to do another cervical check and I'm thinking, yeah, we've got to be pretty far along now. I mean, these contractions are coming pretty close together, less than a minute apart. You know, I'm thinking we're at like seven, eight centimeters. I was at two centimeters. <laughs> two. After 28 hours, two centimeters. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Also, my water had broken on its own during the night, which um, I wasn't expecting it to feel like a rubber band snapping painlessly internally. That was weird. So yeah, um, they gave me some more Pitocin and then uh, we waited a little bit longer and then they basically went, here's the deal. Um, you're not progressing. So you can continue on without an epidural. It's totally your choice, but we would recommend you get one because one, it is very possible that getting the epidural will allow your body to relax enough during the contractions that you will progress and then we'll continue on with a vaginal birth. Or there's option two, which is you still continue to not progress and then you're going to need to get a cesarean. Now, I guess on one hand, you could say that, uh, look at me, I was so brave, facing my fears, facing my anxieties, and like, yeah, I'm not gonna say that that's not true, but also, I had a full-blown panic attack. I did, because what happened was, I got the epidural, and my right leg um, felt like it was falling asleep, and it felt like that the whole time. It was just kind of tingly, little numb, but just, I could still feel it. I could still, uh, rotate my ankle. I could still wiggle my toes. Um, my left leg went completely numb. I had lots of, I started having, um, moments where nurses were moving me and I could see them moving my leg, but I couldn't feel it. And it was causing this really horrible, <laughs> like dissociative, episode essentially. Um, I don't, that's kind of dramatic to call it a dissociative episode, but it was, it felt, oh, very, um, disconnected and very unnatural. And it scared the ever loving shit out of me, which is exactly what I knew would happen. Add onto that, all the sleep deprivation. So yes, I had a full blown panic attack. My nurses were so amazing, so amazing. And they also brought back the very, very busy anesthesiologist who not only turned it down, which didn't do anything. The feeling didn't come back until like 15 minutes after I pushed her out. <laughs> but then she also stuck around long enough to answer my questions because one of my main questions was, I am terrified I'm going to develop a blood clot in that leg and it will kill me. So there was a lot of hyperventilating. There was a lot of uh, overheating and dripping sweat. There was, it was, it was an interesting next couple of hours. Then they came in, they did another check and they were like, oh, you're at eight centimeters. And that honestly took away all of my anxiety because I just thought, oh my God, it worked. It like it did. It allowed me to relax enough that we could progress. It didn't go exactly the way I wanted. That's okay. It's still going. And oh my God, I'm going to have my baby in a couple of hours. And that, oh, that, um, kind of brought me back to myself. Um, yeah, the leg was still not ideal, but, um, it got me refocused on the whole reason I was there. <laughs> um, the most important reason of what I was doing and what I needed to be focusing on. So, you know, uh, I think it was like an hour after that they went, yeah, you're at 10 centimeters. We're good to go. Um, and then it was like, less than 15 minutes of pushing. Um, I think I had her out in like six contractions. And then before I knew it, uh, they're all looking at me going, that she, that's, this is it. This is it. She's here. She's here. Keep pushing, keep pushing. And then she was suddenly, I've got this beautiful, beautiful ginger little girl 
placed on my skin. I was crying. I just remember looking at my husband and saying, I've never been so proud in my life. You can tell I'm still hormonal because I'm getting really choked up right now. Maybe that's not hormones. That might just be... <laughs> It was an amazing moment, so I think I have every right to get choked up, hormones or no. <laughs> My husband was so adorable, so adorable. He, oh. I remember asking him in advance if he wanted to cut the cord, because of course it's kind of like a tradition, I guess, for the non-birthing partner to cut the umbilical cord. And he had said, oh, I don't know, like, like it just kind of icked him out a little bit. He's like, that's like an organ. I don't know if <laughs> I want to be doing that. I'm like, okay, fair enough, but it's, it's totally up to you. But I remember looking off and he's with the, when they, the nurse did have to take her and do all the suctioning and the cleaning up and everything. Um, and it came time to actually cut the cord. Um, he, she asked him, do you want to cut it? And he looked up at me like, like for permission almost and like, but excited. He looked so excited. Like, can I, can I, it was the cutest thing ever but yeah there was no complications baby was healthy i was healthy we stayed at the hospital the allotted amount of time that my insurance would allow and then came home and everything's been good there was um that first week was really rough in regards to mental health with the sleep deprivation um i can if anybody's interested in me talking about that it's not a it's not related to the channel. It's, it's completely just about being a new mother and postpartum and sleep deprived with anxiety disorder. <laughs> um, and, uh, so it's not, you know, related to witchcraft or paganism. I mean, I did lean into my spirituality for assistance in that first week because I it just, it brought me comfort and help, but I don't know if anybody's interested in a video on that aspect. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, once my husband and I kind of figured out a, schedule at night so I could at the very least get three consecutive hours of sleep bare minimum um I have been getting more than that thankfully but we ensured that I got that bare minimum <laughs> each night um things have drastically improved but the whole time no matter what I've just been filled with this absolute wonder and joy and oh my god this is amazing I can't believe I get to be her mom so I know none of that had anything to do with witchcraft, but I thought, I don't know, I thought I'd share that story. But what I do really want to kind of round this up with, um, I mean, I could sit here and go on and on and on about how amazing my baby is because she's so amazing. Her eyes, oh my gosh, just, I know she can't really see that far, but she can see shadows and light and the way she just looks around at the world with such amazement and like curiosity. I just, it's kind of, I've, I've found my mother self, but at the same time, I've also kind of refound my, um, my childlike self as well, because the way she just stares at things, I, you know, I did this painting in her nursery, um, right above her changing table and the way she just stares at it. And I just tell her that's your moon. That's Augustina's moon, the moon that shines for Augustina. And like, I just, tell her that. And it's just really connected me to this very, I don't know, I don't know how, what I'm trying to say exactly. It's, it's becoming a mother has not only helped me find that, you know, going from maiden into mother, but of course the maiden never fully dies. No aspect of you ever fully dies. Um, you have to let it go a little bit, but then there's also parts of it that I have rediscovered in moving on to the mother aspect, which, um, has been really incredible. And then there's also this kind of new, uh, found respect and connection with my body. Like my husband laughs about, um, <laughs> about how I was, I just lost all modesty in the hospital. I mean, you, you have to, not only are your boobs out pretty much constantly if you're nursing. Um, but also, I mean, just you're in a hospital gown. I bought a hospital, a nice, a comfortable one online, but it was constant, like unsnapped in the back and everything's hanging out. And if it hiked up, I didn't care if it was tucked in somewhere and exposing everything. I did not care. These were nurses. I was not concerned about how I looked. I was concerned about my safety, my comfort, 
the progress of the labor, you know, none of the rest of it mattered. And my husband was just like, it was so cute watching you just get up and wander around and you're in a tremendous amount of pain, but your little tushy's hanging out. I was like, thanks. I'm so glad you found that cute. But anyway, it did bring this whole kind of new sense of like, um, confidence, I guess. Not that I'm like going out into the world, slashing it all off now, but it was like, I had to drop away these, these fears and these, it was like the book Labor Like a Goddess, which I did a review on. I'll link it down below and I highly recommend it. It's just dropping away these, these, um, th this feeling of vulnerability, like just let it go, allow yourself to be vulnerable. And I know that has more to do with, a, like that has to do with a lot of things, not just your own nudity and shame about your body, but like, that was a big thing for me was just letting that drop away. And even now, just like having a breastfeed left and right, I haven't had to do it in public too much yet. Um, but that's, you know, another thing I'm kind of, kind of working on where I'm just like, it's not about me. It's not about my, um, it's, it's about feeding my child at the end of the day. It's about, it's about feeding my child. And yes, I still use the cover, but it's still, there's a level of vulnerability there that I'm just been able to kind of like sigh and like shrug off. Um, like it's no big deal, which is just, I mean, I'm 34, about to be 35 next week. And the first time in my life, I feel that way. And then on top of it, I have this new pride in my body. Like I made this perfect little celestial being and I feed her, I nourish her. I did it for 10 months and then now she's outside of me and I'm still continuing to nourish her, give her antibodies, like, oh my God. And even though, yeah, like I could sit here and say like my body didn't cooperate with me and, and it didn't, like things didn't go according to plan. I was not progressing. Um, but at the end of the day it did what I needed it to do and it stayed strong and we've, we've, I say we, like I'm separate from my body, me and my body <laughs> have healed relatively quickly. Like I'm very surprised. I'm very grateful. I know it's not if you've had a cesarean or you've had like, I had a second degree tear. Um, so if you've had a worse tear or something, or like some people just heal at different rates, I totally, I mean, no judgment on anybody for taking a longer time to recuperate. Um, I haven't been like doing any crazy workouts or anything. Don't, don't misunderstand me. But the fact that I, you know, a few days after getting home from the hospital, I was back out walking my neighborhood, which is very, very hilly, um, pushing a stroller, been doing the baby carrying thing. I just have this new sense of pride in what my body can accomplish. So even though I think I, f I feel, feel like for the first time in my life, even though I'm sitting here and I'm my body is slowly getting back to a shape that I recognize, right? So it still doesn't really quite look what I'm used to it looking like. But then in addition to that, um, it's, I'm still, I don't even know how many pounds, many, many, many pounds heavier than I would, than I prefer to be. I'm okay with it because it's just like, I'll get back to all of that. Right now, my body did did an amazing job. It did what it needed to do. And I'm really proud of that instead of sitting here going like, I am uncomfortable with myself. Like, I mean, and again, no shame if people don't find that kind of newfound confidence after having a baby. Totally understandable that people wouldn't. But um, I'm just, I and, I and I thought I would be one of those people, honestly. But um, I don't know. It's just giving me this new perspective and this new outlook. And I don't know, I might have a second baby and feel completely different afterward. <laughs> um, <laughs> but right now I'm kind of enjoying this, this new confidence and this new pride. Anyway, uh, I feel like I didn't actually talk a lot about witchy stuff in this vlog, uh, this third trimester and labor and delivery vlog. And I'm very sorry about that. Um, my bad. I really hope you enjoyed it anyway. If there's anything else in regards to that, that you guys would like me to touch on again, for instance, um, the hormone crash and the sleep deprivation that happened that week afterward, two weeks afterward, I feel like I'm just now kind of on the other side of the hormone aspect of it. Um, and also, you know, that you guys know, I, 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 don't mind. And I actually enjoy talking about mental health and I don't mind talking about my own personal experiences as somebody with general anxiety disorder and bipolar disorder. Um, I do not mind discussing kind of what my experience was. If you're interested, I'm not going to bother making a video 
if you're not interested. So let me know in the comments below. Um, anyway, thank you so much for going on this journey with me. Um, this has been a wild, wild year for me. So <laughs> thank you so much for tagging along. Once again, thank you all so much for tuning in and for all of your love and support that you've shown uh, throughout this whole process. I really appreciate it. I know I've never met any of you, um, but I love you all so much. I just really appreciate the comments that you guys left. Um, and yeah, anyway, uh, I'll talk to you all soon.